Charles Eisenstein has been writing about the need for systems change and personal transformation for many years, in books like Sacred Economics and The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. In response to the pandemic crisis, he wrote an article, The Coronation, that has been widely shared. The things that I've been uh, foreseeing and also fearing are all coming together at once. So on the one hand, the breakdown of normal that gives us an opportunity to choose what we've been unconsciously choosing before. We also discussed some of the criticisms of the article, whether it bypassed anger and the need for change in favour of making people feel better about themselves. Is this not the time for righteous anger? I do think it's time for righteous anger. Uh, the, the trick that the controlling forces of this world have used is that they again and again divert the righteous anger onto a false target and onto false solutions. Charles, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I'm familiar with your work and I think it's about time we had you on the channel because you write about a lot of the same things that many of the other people we feature on the channel talk about, in particular kind of systems change and possible other operating systems for the society that we have and also linking it to like personal growth and personal change at the same time. Given what's going on right now, like I think a lot of people are recognizing a few things. One, how interconnected everything is, and also how this sort of idea about alternative operating systems seems to be coming into a sharp relief for a lot of people. How do you think that this current crisis is, is showing, is kind of throwing into relief your work from before? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's kind of hard to summarize it. That's why I, that's why the article ended up being 9,000 words. I didn't try to write such a long article, but there was just so much to say. Uh, so there's a, a few themes in it. Um, but one, one of the, as far as like how it relates to my earlier work, I've been writing about how change happens through crisis, uh, even through a process of initiation where the old normal falls apart where we recognize finally that reality is not what we had thought it to be and that therefore we ourselves are not who we thought ourselves to be because self and reality are inter interwoven. We're not just separate selves floating in an external reality, but our relationships are part of ourselves. In fact, you could even say that we are a relationship. And this is one of the realizations that's coming out, as you were saying, that we're all interconnected, you know, through the uh, COVID crisis. So it's, it's like um, the things that I've been uh, foreseeing and also fearing are all coming together at once. So on the one hand, the breakdown of normal that gives us an opportunity to choose what we've been unconsciously choosing before. Like unconscious choices are, are being brought in, to our attention and therefore we're being asked, do we wanna keep going in the direction we've been going? It doesn't mean that COVID is going to rescue us from the path that we've been on, but it's at least putting us into a, into a um, liminal zone where the reinforcing circumstances of our old way of life are temporarily dispelled. And we can say, yeah, do we really want to continue down the road of, of separation? One of the things that's, that's being shown to us, like none, of the, none of our responses to coronavirus are anything new. They're all intensifications of trends that have gone on for a long time. For example, the um, migration of social interaction onto the internet. Like that has been happening for 20 years, at least. Now we're forced to do it and it's taken to an extreme. Or the, um, or the movement of commerce online, or the um, regime of hygiene and the, the fear of germs, or the movement of life indoors. When I was a kid, we were, there, were, there were packs of kids outside playing all the time. And now, and, and to be kept indoors was a punishment. Like you're not allowed to go out and play. Now it's kind of the opposite. 
And this did not all of a sudden happen with coronavirus or the uh, restriction of political freedoms, uh, the censorship of information, uh, the destruction of small businesses. Uh, like all of these things, the, the, the increasing medicalization of life, uh, all of these things were already happening. And now we get to ask, do we want them to continue to happening when we're being shown what they are like taken to the extreme? My hope is that we'll say, no, we don't want to sacrifice everything for the holy cause of risk minimization. Maybe we will accept a bit more risk, accept that death is part of life and no longer live in this regime of control that seeks to, to minimize risk, control every variable, guard against the world, guard against each other, and therefore not even really live in an, in an attempt to forestall death. I was struck by one of the metaphors that you used in your article, because I've heard it a few times now, and it's the, the addict rehab metaphor. And I think it comes up a lot. People are it seems to illustrate things very well, this sort of idea that um, there's a sort of delusional way of being that maybe we're now being confronted with and, and that in that there is a choice. Can you unpack that for me? How do you see that metaphor being useful? Yeah, so on the one hand, uh, one, of the, uh, res- one of the approaches to, to addiction is in, it's called an intervention where you, by force, if necessary, pluck the person out of the totality of their circumstances that um, f- that make the addiction happen. Like the, the addiction is part of an entire life, an entire lifestyle, your surroundings and so forth. If, if nothing else changes, then the addiction isn't going to change either. So you intervene and, and interrupt the routines, the relationships, the, the whole way of life of the addict. And that doesn't mean that they're cured but it means that they have um, at least a chance to make other changes and to look at the things that the addiction was obscuring. Because addictions kind of work, uh, temporarily at least. They, they dull the pain. They're, they, in fact, they originate as a coping mechanism. And for them, and, and the problem is that the price that they take to keep working gets greater and greater and greater. So on a, on, the, on a grand scale, I think that we have a society that is itself addicted to control. Addiction, the things that, that people use um, you know, as the, their um, pathways of addiction, these are ways to control life in some way, to control pain, to control emotions, to control other people and so forth. So our culture, our society, let me say, responds to its problems through various technologies of control. Or another example would be the, um, the piling up of pharmaceutical medications, each one causing symptoms that another one is uh, added in to address or agricultural technology where, where um, tractors and uh, chemical fertilizers destroy the soil and uh, allow pests to proliferate. And so then you add a pesticide and that destroys the soil even more. So you add another one and another one and pretty soon you're completely dependent on the chemicals. So the same pattern or foreign policy, you know, there's terrorists, you bomb them or you try to keep them out, and somehow it doesn't solve the problem. Something else happens and you need even more and more and more control. So generally, the big picture is that our society is addicted to control. The response every time it doesn't work is more of it. And just like with an addiction, the price that we pay that is gouged out of our lives and gouged out of our souls is greater and greater. What is it in America? Like, 15% of the population or something ridiculous like that is clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. And another huge chunk of them are have anxiety and another huge chunk are addicted, et cetera, et cetera. It's like half the people have some serious psychological disorder. Mm -hmm. And what do we do then? 
more control, um, mood altering uh, pharmaceutical medicines, like will control your very brain. But at some point, we need this interruption to say, hold on here. Is this working? Have we actually hit bottom? Like this is showing us where bottom is going to be, like what, what current trends are taking us toward. And that's why I have hope in this crisis, as well as a certain amount of despair and despondency. Before we started recording, you asked me, how am I doing? You know, and like, sometimes I'm like, oh my God, everything that I've been afraid of is happening now. And, and I see this timeline going into a dystopian future where it becomes normal never to leave your house. Like a lot of people in this country haven't been that disrupted because they were already shopping online for everything and everything was getting delivered to their house and not talking to anybody when they went shopping. Uh, and now you don't even need to go shopping. You can get deliveries to your house. Like, why do we even think we're going to go back to normal? And how far could it go? Could we see uh, a world where even dating is online and procreation happens via sex robots? Where, you know, the sex robot comes to your house and you deposit your sperm and then goes to a lab and so on and so forth. Like, like and I'm not predicting that, but from the totalitarian nightmare of constant surveillance to the nightmare of, of separation from each other, like all of these things are happening. And so sometimes I'm like, I go through this despondency, but it helps me to recognize that this is also, it's, it's a choice point, making our old trajectory visible, conscious, and therefore we could still choose to go that way, but we're, maybe there's an awareness now that we do have a choice. Yeah, and you mentioned, um, for example, the medicalization crisis in American society. And let's, let's not just keep it to America, let's talk about sort of more worldwide, but um, you use the metaphor in the article of the taut rope, which I think is quite a good, a good one, because what it seems is happening is that this crisis is showing, it's kind of unveiling a lot of the stress points for example, in the economic system where we've taken out all of the slack and so we're vulnerable to a shock like this. Also, if you look at kind of our immune systems or uh, the, the, the kind of medicalization of so many people in America, like we've taken out the slack of so many systems and we've, we've got weak systems in so many places. And what it seems is happening is this, this crisis is kind of unveiling or showing us the kind of stress points in society. Yeah, very fragile. Everything's very fragile. Um, our financial system is very fragile, like tightly leveraged, you know, so there's just no, as you're saying, no slack in it. And even our psychologies, you know, we're, we're, we're not resilient. The, the Hong Kong flu that struck in 1968 killed, um, according to some estimates, 4 million people worldwide. And the population was half that. So that would be the equivalent of like, you know, maybe 8 million people. Uh, coronavirus has killed what so far? 60,000 maybe? Hmm. Like not even in the ballpark. And I asked my mother if she remembered Hong Kong flu. She didn't even remember it. Hmm. Nobody was panicking. And yeah, like you could say that, okay, so it's, it's an interesting question, why? Hmm. And I think that it's similar to what you're saying that that we were healthier psychologically um, healthier in that we weren't so afraid of death and so fixated on preserving youth and preserving life uh, at all costs. Um, we were psychologically less fragile and so, socially less fragile. Mm -hmm. And now our civilization is just like, yeah, like I said, like this rope that's pulled tighter and tighter and tighter until it just takes a little, little touch for it to snap. And if it wasn't going to be this, it was going to be something else. So now we're in it. And <clears throat> this is another thing, just the uncertainty. Um, one of the things I was saying in the essay is that maybe it is time to release into the uncertainty rather than to try to cling to the old normal and to bring normal back. Because normal wasn't that great, was it? given the 
like the statistics I was referencing about addiction and depression and obesity and autoimmunity, like we haven't even been getting healthier. In 1968, people were way healthier than they were, at least by some measures, than they were in 1928. Life expectancy in America in 1900 was about 46 years. And in 1960, it was like 72, 73. So it increased by 25, 26 years in half a century. And then the next half century, it decreased by maybe, it increased by maybe six years. And after that, it didn't increase at all. And now it's actually declining. And people are not as healthy overall either. All these chronic diseases have arisen that can't be controlled very well. Like the technologies of, of control do not cure almost any of the major diseases of our time. Mm. They can't cure autoimmunity. They can't really cure heart disease. They can't cure diabetes. They can't cure uh, cancer. I mean, sometimes you can, but overall, like cancer is still the number two killer. Um, you can kind of control them, but you can't cure them. You can't win this triumph that was part of the ideology of the onward march of science and the onward march of medicine. We were supposed to have no disease by the year 2000. That was, that was the future. That was the shining future when I was a kid. Like it was going to be awesome, the future. And the future never came. So there's also this, another thing that I didn't write about in the essay that much, but that's really coming up, um, you know, with all of these, you could call them conspiracy theories, uh, or you could call them uh, alternate narratives. What's becoming visible is incredible distrust in the authorities. A lot of people just don't even really believe what they're being told by scientific and political authority. And this is also like, this would not have happened in the late sixties, you know, or even up until maybe 20 years ago, uh, people would generally believe that there was a consensus about what was true and what was real in society, a broad consensus, not anymore. A lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of people are kind of going along with it, but underneath, I think there's a lot of skepticism. Mm. And especially among like working class people. Why would you believe what you're being told when you, when you feel like you've been betrayed by the very authorities that you're supposed to listen to? The authorities that were supposed to be preparing this marvelous future for us to live in. Mm. And it's just gotten worse. Not only has health gotten worse, but people's economic situation has gotten worse. Every generation was better off than their parents until this generation. I'm worse off than my parents and a lot of my peers are, and I'm generation X. I mean, down the road, it's even like millennials. I mean, you know, forget like trying to own your own house or anything like that. Mm. The inequality of income is intensified to the, to the, to an extreme. So, yeah, I think the end of the world as we know it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it can be a very bad thing. One question I'd, I'd ask is, is there a danger of confirmation bias in that you've been writing about these things for a very long time and now we, we have this situation and this danger of saying, aha, see, I was right all along. Is there a concern there of, of just sort of seeing things through a particular lens that, that you've, you've already built up? There's a lot of confirmation bias going on. Um, that, I mean, that's how conspiracy narratives are built. You, you <clears throat> kind of screen out the things that don't fit the narrative. You take in the things that do. You interpret things in order that they fit the narrative. And it's, um, you know, anything that contradicts it, you uh, examine it um, rigorously and make sure, you know, who's saying that and what, and, and could this be just propaganda and so forth and anything that 
you agree with that you take that in uncritically. The thing is the mainstream does the exact same thing. On an institutional level, science is subject to tremendous confirmation bias. Otherwise, how could we have been told for 30 or 40 years that dietary cholesterol causes heart disease when it's utterly not true? And finally, after 40 years of certainty, that orthodoxy is dissolving. So confirmation bias and other forms of cognitive bias are rampant in the coronavirus outbreak, uh, both within the mainstream. <clears throat> and, and it's not like there's, you know, conspiratorial overlords who are directing the confirmation bias. Maybe there are, I don't know. Like this is, um, like I can go there, uh, but it's just the tilt of the playing field toward a certain narrative so that, you know, if, um, um, you know, say if there is a hospital that's, that's being overwhelmed, like that gets in the news. And if there's one that's not being overwhelmed and that's laying off doctors because there's, you know, not enough for them to do because there's no traffic fatalities anymore or something like that, or people are being forced to stay home if it's not essential, then that doesn't get in the news. So the media creates an, an hysteria that is far out of proportion to the actual number of deaths or even the actual risk. <clears throat> and, and you don't need somebody to mandate that that uh, psyop is going to happen in order for it to happen. As for my own confirmation bias, I mean, I have been going through, I've, uh, I've gone into like, <clears throat> whichever of these narratives that I ta am reading, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I go through this turmoil, this doubt of like, oh my God, maybe that's right. Maybe I'm totally wrong. How do I know that I'm right? How do I know that this epidemic, pandemic, whatever you call it, isn't as bad as we're being told? Do I actually know that? Maybe it's going to be worse than we're being told. Why do I, why do I as Daniel Schmachtenberger wrote in a beautiful little post, um, how do I know that what I believe is true? Most people, and I'm not exempt from this, choose their data points in order that they fit existing beliefs, in order that they confirm that I've been right all along, in order that they uh, reinforce a familiar worldview and a familiar self-image. Anything that doesn't fit that is an attack. It's an attack on my identity. So it actually takes a bit of courage and humility to entertain narratives that um, contradict what you had believed in the past. And it's a shock. And people go into denial when, when it happens. Maybe there's a lot of denial going on right now, but denial is a phase. Yeah. You know, it's part of a larger process. Eventually, the, the denial is um, harder and harder to maintain. And you enter the next phase, ultimately accepting that you don't know. And that is similar to the acceptance of death, actually. It's the same fear of the unknown, fear of transcending who you are right now. And that fear, the fear of death, has governed our society increasingly for a long time, which is inevitable from the story of self that prevails in our society, a separate self in a world of other. If that's what you accept being to be, then death is the worst possible outcome. It's the annihilation of all that is, all yourself, the universe of self. And so, of course, we have a medical system and an entire uh, narrative now that's all about saving lives. Yeah, you mentioned in the article about death aversion and how that's one of the, the dynamics that's going on. And the, I think you, you, you pretty much say that we're going to have to come to terms with what freedoms are we prepared to um, 
forego in exchange for some acceptance of risk. Would you, is that about right? It's um, a matter of conflicting values. You know, like um, when we hold life sacred and we hold our beloved fellow beings, our parents, our grandparents, um, people who are immunocompromised. I mean, these people are equally sacred and equally worthy of life as anybody else. And so that's a value that we should do whatever it takes to protect these people. Like my mother is in this category. She's in her late 70s. She's um, had cancer. She's frail. If she got COVID-19, she would probably die. And she's loving life. Probably, you know, she just wrote her obituary the other day. Like she's probably not going to live that much longer. Um, but who knows? Maybe she'll be with us for several more years. And she's loving every day of her life. She's like, oh, the sunshine, it's so beautiful. You know, she, if she can sit in the sunshine and hear birds singing, she is totally content with that. Every day is precious to her. And I value that. And I want her to have, if, it, if, if she can have six more months of that, I want that. And I'm willing not to visit her for, a, for this month in order to keep her safe. But would I be willing to not visit her for six months or a year? And would I be willing to maybe never see her again? Would that be worth it? Would I be willing to tell the whole world to stop, um, to, to stop gathering just so that my mother can survive? No, I don't think so. I don't think that that's, so there's other values here that, that it's a, always a trade-off of values. Like what are we willing to sacrifice to keep these precious ones safe? Are we willing you know, to practice social distancing forever if it reduces the death rate? And, and and makes average life expectancy six months higher. I mean, a lot of the people who are dying of COVID are going to die anyway. I mean, everyone's going to die anyway. But, you know, in Italy, for example, the median age of death was like 80. It's been 80. So that means that half the people who have died are over 80. Well, life expectancy in Italy is around 80 anyway. So So these people, you know, on average, who are, who have been dying of coronavirus could have, maybe they had an average of six months to live anyway, or who knows, you know, is, is it worth totally changing the way that we live in order to postpone death a little bit? Sometimes it is like, there are times where I would be like, yeah, mom, I'm sorry, I'm not going to visit you. Um, Cause it'll be over in a few weeks, and then I'll be able to visit you. Like, it's a worthwhile sacrifice. But we have to be clear um, that a lot of the rationale for social distancing, quarantines, and so forth, isn't going to go away. The virus, I mean, okay, maybe this virus will subside, but there's always the possibility of a mutant variation of it, or another one, or the, the flu, or, or there's always going to be a reason to maintain these practices or they say you can get reinfected with it you know maybe it's endemic <clears throat> we're going to have it forever so the questions that come up in the short term it, are the sacrifices worth it they're going to remain with us in the long term too and it brings up what do we value do we value the prolonging of life at any cost or do we value play the exploration of our boundaries, the challenging of limits, adventure. I mean, people make choices all the time that are, are risky, like to go to a festival. It's much safer to stay at home, uh, to let your kid play outside. It's much safer to keep them indoors, um, to, to go to a bar, to get on the highway. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of choices that we make in order to live life fully, that put living life longer at risk. And I think that this conversation about our values is unavoidable. And hitting home for a lot of people, um, 
like my friend, Lisa Rankin, who's an MD, she's saying, do you guys really know what it is like to be on a respirator? And she cites these statistics, like two thirds of the people who go on respirators for this die anyway. So instead of dying sooner, uh, surrounded by loved ones, they're dying after several weeks of torture with a machine breathing them in an ICU behind glass, saying goodbye to their loved ones on FaceTime. But they get to live two or three weeks longer for a 30% chance of, of eventually coming out of that, but severely compromised. It's not like you're better cured, you know? Like, is this conversation even being had? The medical system is geared around um, saving lives. It has no conception of dying well. Hospitals do not keep records of did the patient die well. It's only the fatality rate. So these are just, this is just the tip of the iceberg of, of conversations that we need to start having right now. And in the, the article, you kind, you kind of, um, as you said before, you see it as a kind of inflection point. Could it be a, a transition or the beginning of a transition to, to a better system than the one we have? Or could it be, could it go the other way? And I've seen a couple of criticisms of you. I, I, I saw Daniel Pinchbeck wrote quite a long one on Facebook that you responded to. And I think his, to boil his down, he was sort of saying that he, he felt that you were in danger of kind of wishful thinking, that it was, that he, he's more in the sort of, we, we need to be planning actual kind of action. We need to be having plans right now. And he was sort of suggesting that you were, um, Kind of making people feel better, but not not giving them any guidance of what to do in the situation. I, I disagreed with that critique. Um, I'm not saying that coronavirus is going to come and save us. You know that it's delivering us from the situation that we've been in, and automatically going to bring us a better world. And so take comfort. You know, this is a good thing. Um, what I'm saying is that it is making our choice starkly apparent to us doesn't guarantee we're going to make the right choice, but it is showing us that for one thing, like I was saying before, that, that normal isn't even necessarily where we want to be, it's, but it's making our old trajectory starkly obvious. So, and, I, and also in the, in the piece, I'm offering things like um, uh, that part about, about death denial and a whole other piece is about uh, the, the title of that section was Life is Community, saying that, that here's the irony, that even the things that we're doing to prolong life don't actually necessarily do it. The things that we're doing for the sake of health don't actually make us healthier, like excessive hygiene, which cuts us off, and social distancing, which cuts us off from the constant interchange with the world that's necessary to maintain a healthy immune system a healthy gut, gut biome and so forth. So yeah, I'm not saying, okay, therefore, you know, let's have, here's my plan for a big program to um, introduce more um, probiotics into the diet and get our hands dirty again and so forth. But I think that that's implicit in what I'm saying. When, when we take in more information, then our choices change and what we recognize as possible changes. So that's, and, and I think that as well, if we don't accept the opportunity that we're being offered to take a step back and take in more data points and survey the situation from a larger perspective, then we're going to be trapped in patterns of response that are actually part of the problem. And, and the main pattern of response is, uh oh, a bad thing's happening. Let's find something to kill. Let's find something to control. Let's find something to keep out. Let's keep the, our world safe, our world of separation safe. It's the same kind of thinking applied to coronavirus as is applied to, you know, immigration or terrorism or crime. How do we keep ourselves safe from these bad guys? That pattern of thought needs to be interrupted. We need to, to take a pause and we're being offered that. Not that the pause is magically going to change things, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying let's take in 
the full spectrum of information. Let's, let's see what happens when the unconscious is brought into visibility, into consciousness. Yeah, I guess, I guess sort of following that thread, my concern, I spoke to Joe Brewer the other day, who's kind of got a name for himself as, as um, he's a complexity theorist and, and looks at cognitive science and cultural evolution. And he said, we know that the kind of more Machiavellian, maybe the people trying to defend the old regime, the more sort of sociopathic tendencies will be activating right now. They will be kind of looking at how they, like disaster capitalism, Naomi Klein's idea that we know they will be doing stuff. How do we, and people um, who are writing books like A, A Better World, Their Hearts Know If Possible, how do we compete with those people, with the knowing that there are kind of really ruthless people out there looking for control of the situation? That there is a concern there, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. Um, and so what I look at is what are the ground conditions that allow those people to even prey on the rest of us? What makes the totalitarian response to coronavirus uh, so compelling that people go along with it? What makes the um, war on germs so compelling? Like, because these uh, psychopaths in power, they don't have, it's not like they're superhuman. It's not like they have a mind control ray necessarily. Their power comes because everyone goes along with it. That's where I get down to the governing stories of our civilization. The story of separation, the story of ascent, that human destiny is to rise above nature, the story of the separate self, the story of control that comes from that. Like once you accept all of these basic things, then uh, mal malignant powers can leverage those. They can leverage the fear. They can leverage the, they can, they can play um, divide and conquer. If you are pre so that, that's a good example. If you are predisposed to diagnose a problem as being caused by a bad guy, by an enemy, then a manipulative um, leader can come and say, here's the problem. It's those enemies. And we're in a, and we're, this is war. And so you're going to have to make some sacrifices to keep the bad guys out. And that's what Goring said at, at Nuremberg, you know, that, yeah, it's easy to get the population to go along. Just proclaim that there's an enemy and that they're at the gates and that we, that if you don't go along with it, you're a traitor. And, you know, he, this is a, this is standard operating procedure. And, and we have in our civilizational myths and narratives, fertile ground for such manipulations to take root. And the antidote to that is solidarity. The antidote to that is um, a new story, a story of interconnection and interbeing that says, yeah, is it really an enemy? Or let's question that. How am I part of the enemy? How am I part of the conditions that breed terrorism or immigration or crime? How is everything connected? How am I part of a viral infection? Like I mentioned in the article, terrain theory, which can be summarized by the meme that I saw. Um, germ, uh, your fish is sick. Germ theory, isolate the fish. Terrain theory, clean the tank. So we have a very dirty tank here. Uh, we have, like, why are people so susceptible to this? If you look at the, the fatality statistics, it's obvious. Almost everybody who died from this had serious pre-existing conditions. So that's part of the dirty tank. Why? Why are there so many diabetic people? Why are there so many um, people with high blood pressure? Uh, in Italy, the, in the statistics I saw, 75% of those who died had high blood pressure. 35% were diabetic. 30% had um, uh, uh, is, is, ischemia, um, you know, so, so, th so yeah, just to answer your question, rather than to fight the um, evil Illuminati and psychopaths and disaster capitalists, and I'm not saying we shouldn't fight them, but let me say in addition to fighting them, we have to change the battlefield on which we're fighting that dooms us to 
one defeat after another after another. And these ground conditions go layer after layer after layer, layer into the structure of the financial system, for example, uh, based on uh, interest-bearing debt. Like that already casts us into competition with each other. But down to the bedrock of who do we know ourselves to be? What's real? How does the world work? How does change happen? What's possible? Who am I? How do, what is a good life? What's the purpose of life? The answers that we have been immersed in prime the field for the regime of domination and control that we live in today. That's, you know, I mean, that's a big thesis to, to lay out. Uh, that's my first book, The Ascent of Humanity. I wrote like, you know, 600 pages of diagnosing that. Uh, tracing our institutions, a world under control to the story of self um, and how that story historically developed. I, I certainly am trying to hold both of those pieces that potentially this could be the beginning of a transition. I think it has to be the, the beginning of a transition into a different system. But my sense is that that's going to take a long time and it's going to be incredibly painful and incredibly difficult to get there. And it seems very difficult for, even in myself, I feel this difficulty of holding both of those pieces. It's very difficult to, to look full in the face the, like how difficult it will probably be for us to go through the, the death of the old system. How, how is it possible to, to live into and live through that without kind of bypassing it in any way? You know, I, I look within and ask, am I really ready for the death of the old system? What part of me, I mean, I've been, you know, I've spent my life advocating systems change, but there's part of me that doesn't want systems change. There's part of me that was, as a fairly privileged person, you know, pretty comfortable with the way things were. Am I willing to step into the unknown? Am I willing to step into, it's a kind of a death, the death of what was familiar and therefore who I was in that familiarity? Um, am I willing to sacrifice, you know, flying to exciting places to give speeches that, um, you know, are moving and inspiring and seem to be helping people, but do I really know that they were helping people? Like, am I willing to give that up? Um, are we willing to give up being able to just order supplements. Like I like ordering supplements, you know? Uh, I was, I'm using these, uh, like these homeopathic energy medicine sleep patches that uh, have like solved my insomnia. You know, like I would wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to go back to sleep and like, wow, I can sleep through the night now, you know? And I ordered these things online because my credit card worked. That could all end. And it could end in different ways. That's what I'm saying. And it may not end. Like we could have what I, the future that I call, call hippie planet, you know, where everything, instead of doubling down on conventional medicine, which is what could happen if we have universal health care from this, it can become mandatory health care. I mean, already chiropractors and acupuncturists have been shut down all over the country. Like I cannot go to my chiropractor. Um, my wife is an acupuncturist and healer. People cannot come to her. It's deemed not essential. So like, you know, we could go, we could go either of these ways. And in a way we're kind of going both at the same time, but, but right now it's, I have this sense of dread that we've taken a couple steps down the wrong path and that, it's going to take a pretty dramatic shift for us to jump from this path onto the path toward holistic planet, toward hippie planet. You mean that we've taken a step or already during this crisis, we've taken a step down. Yeah, I wanted to come back to that just, just before I do. Um, 
And, and Daniel Pinchbeck mentioned this, but I just wanted to kind of raise it as, is this not the time for righteous anger? Like we've got, we've basically got a set of authorities that didn't see this coming, that seem to be, beha- seem to be kind of mishandling it completely. I see a lot of people like Eric Weinstein, for example, getting kind of calling for heads on spikes. And Daniel wrote also about maybe this is the time for righteous anger, for kind of motivating and, and taking action to create the new world that we're... we're I do think, yes, I, I, I do think it's time for righteous anger. Uh, the, the trick that the controlling forces of this world have used is that they again and again divert the righteous anger onto a false target and onto false solutions. So yeah, there, people, there is a lot of bubbling anger and there well should be because we have been, as a collective, we've been betrayed we could be living in an incredibly beautiful, abundant world right now. There is enough for everybody. There's enough of everything that we need for everybody. But instead, we live in a society of intensifying artificial scarcity, enormous waste side by side with enormous poverty, a million homeless people next to tens of millions of vacant housing units. <clears throat> Uh, one in seven children in America going hungry every month next to 40 or 50% of food being wasted. I mean, I, I could give many examples of, of the obscene juxtaposition of, of overabundance and poverty. Um, so, yeah, there, the, we, we should embrace the anger because it is valid. It points to a violation. But to then say, but uh, yeah, to, to offer too hasty a target for that anger risks replicating that pattern of, of um, diffusing it by, by um, diverting it onto a, a, a false target. The people who look like they are the perpetrators, they are functionaries, actually. They are playing a role that's systemically necessary. And if we put their heads on on spikes, guess what? New people are going to come and do the same thing that the old people did. So where should the righteous anger be targeted? I'm not even sure if targeted is the right way to think about it. The righteous anger ideally will flush out the truth. It should never be satisfied with a false explanation. It should be vigilant. It should say anytime that it's being offered a channel, it should say, really? Are you sure? Because I'm mad and I want it to change. I don't want to, to, to run off in a mob and, you know, find some scapegoats and string them up and not change anything. Like that's, that, that, all of that is a betrayal of the anger, actually. So even the idea of find a target for it, that's part of the trick. That's, a, that's the diversion. It doesn't mean that things don't need to change but it asks what needs to change so that the conditions that generated this betrayal and this violation no longer exist. And it could be that the best route to that involves um, compassion and forgiveness. Those, these are not um, uh, the opposite of anger. They are the result of the truth that anger can flush to the surface. And this is, yeah, this is deep, uh, deep work here, but the anger is what can can keep us on point and not be satisfied with sops, with with booby prizes. And this sort of brings us back to the idea that we sort of hinted at before that it does seem that the orthodoxy. Like what it seems is happening, as far as I can see right now, you look at sort of the financial system, we might be seeing kind of a bailout to dwarf 2008. We're seeing a lot of the same kind of thinking just being doubled down on 
again and again, and this sort of sense that um, it, the system is reacting in the only way that it knows, but it seems to be doubling down on the same kind of thinking and kind of um, methods that created some of these systemic crises in the first place. Can you speak to that? Because I think you, you talk about that in your essay. There is also signs of, of I mean, in America, there's a moratorium on foreclosures and evictions. Um, and that, so that's something that actually does help the common people. What we should be advocating for in terms of a bailout is what I call a debtor's bailout, as opposed to a creditor's bailout. <clears throat> in after 28, 20, 2008, the, after that financial crisis, we had a creditor's bailout where the, the Fed and the Treasury basically bought up uh, all of the troubled assets, which are what? Like fundamentally they were troubled because people couldn't make their payments on their mortgages. So they were bought up, but did people have to stop making their payments? No, people had to continue. The debts all stayed on the books. An alternative strategy would be to buy them up so that the banks, yeah, they're made whole, the banks do get bailed out, but then the debts get forgiven. And we're seeing some, some stirrings of that actually, um, to maybe forgive some portion of student debt. Ultimately though, the only way I think to uh, resolve the increasing inequality that we have today is through some kind of debt jubilee. And that is profoundly radical uh, because it, it redresses or reverses a, a legacy of, of oppression and inequality, um, even going back to slavery, even going back to, to colonialism and indentured servitude and so forth, um, and kind of wipes the slate clean. So, yeah, that's 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 one thing I would like to um, bring into the into the awareness, and I'm seeing it a little bit. Uh, debt, some kind of debt forgiveness. Like, I mean, this is part of the righteous anger. Like this recognition that I'm not supposed to live my life in hawk to the banks. Like, people, you know, graduate, and maybe it's you know in this country it's especially severe. But levels of debt are rising everywhere. Like my life is not my own. I owe my productive capacity to these distant, distant institutions. People, you know, graduate from school with, with sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt that they'll never pay off their entire lives. Your labor is not your own. And of course, we're angry about that. When one or two generations before, you could have a working class job, support a family, like you didn't even have to have both parents working. You could have a working class job, support a family, save money, buy your, have your own house, eventually own it free and clear. You didn't have to be in the elite to do that. Why can't we do that anymore? Have, have we regressed technologically? Have we lost our ability to build houses as well? No, we should be richer. It should be even more accessible than it was two generations ago, but it's the opposite. So yeah, that's something to be angry about. And that would be to answer your earlier question, a target, a debt jubilee is not a target. It's not someone that we can punish for our oppression. It is something that, that removes the conditions under which we've been so violated. Yeah, my last question is, it kind of summarizes some of the questions that I've asked already, which is how do we live and lead into that better world that our hearts know is possible when in so many areas we sort of feel our hearts bleeding and we see the world burning? Yeah, the title is actually the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Hmm. Um, and you know the the word beautiful was I, I chose that quite purposefully as a different orienting principle in contrast to efficiency. 
and the um, cult of quantity that governs our society. And I would just offer that as, as, as an orientation. And it, it plays into even, you know, decisions about life and death. Quantity says, how many years can I live? Beauty says, how can I live well? It provokes questions of why am I here to begin with? I'm not going to survive life. I'm not going to have that on my gravestone. He's, he made it till now. You know, that's, there's, there's an illusion that we're living in, essentially that we're going to live forever. When that illusion is dissolved, we can be in truth. What comes from that is unique to each person. But I think that as a society, if we are able to release that delusion, which on a collective level is, you know, basically that we are here to transcend nature, that other beings don't matter, that our own survival is the most important thing. I mean, this even gets into environmental discourse when, we're, when we say, well, we're going to have to change now, otherwise we won't survive. And I'm like, well, what if we can survive on a concrete world? where we grow our food in these vats and hydroponics factories and, and modulate the atmosphere with carbon sucking machines. You know, what if we can survive? Is that why we're here? Is that, is that the most beautiful world that we can imagine? Yeah. Maybe according to everything measurable, we'll be fine. We'll have more gigabytes of downloads per person, more bandwidth per person, more life expectancy per person, higher GDP per, per capita. But when we, when we reduce life to quantity, then the qualitative gets left out. And this is another addiction. When the qualitative is missing, like intimacy and beauty, then we need more and more stuff to compensate for it. I'm not even sure what your question was or if I've answered it, hmm. but... A brush with death can resurrect these lost truths. And I'm, I'm holding that out as a potential outcome of the coronavirus, that it is bringing death into our, you know, putting death in our faces and thereby resurrecting these questions of what is in fact a good life and why are we trying to preserve life at all costs, rather than celebrate life and live life fully, live it beautifully, not just live it long. Why am I here? Am I here just to survive and reproduce and maximize my self-interest and go to the grave anyway? Or am I here to make something beautiful of my life so that instead of leaving no trace, I leave a positive trace on the world? And I'm part of this evolutionary project of life itself to create more and more life and a world that's more and more beautiful. That's the initiation. You know, the essay, I titled it The Coronation as an initiation into sovereignty, into kingship, queenship. The true sovereign is somebody who is in service and is consciously choosing that in service to what? In service to the kingdom, in service to life. That is only possible when death shows us how precious life is because it ends, therefore it's precious. And our society doesn't get that. We don't, we don't embrace and accept death. We think we can live forever. We think that the highest goal is to preserve life, preserve, our, preserve the self, 
the separate self, which is actually not permanent, no matter what. It's a huge delusion. And yeah, maybe we're catching in this pause, we have this opportunity to, to look at that and to choose otherwise. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.